This video contains brief mentions of self-harm. While not addressed in depth, it is an element present in the topic of discussion. Released in 2017, Mr. Miracle is a 12-issue series, written by Tom King, with pencils, inks, and colors, done by Mitch Gerrids. Neither creator was overly well known at the time, but the series would definitely gain them notoriety. The first issue itself is an example of nearly perfect execution, one that introduces all the various elements to be explored and the conflict that will unfold during its run, which is the reason this issue deserves a certain level of scrutiny. As a first issue, it is fairly dense, and it manages to say a lot of things by saying very little. It's a good balance of art and writing that gives the audience what they need while layering in a subtext that elevates the material. At the same time, it has a well-managed pace, and it flows seamlessly from scene to scene. One aspect that works well is that it basically adheres to the screenwriting tenant of enter a scene late and leave early. There's no preamble. There's no lingering. It is highly economical. As a bit of a disclaimer, some elements require a fair amount of interpretation. So what follows is my interpretation based on what's on the page, my understanding of fourth world mythology, and whatever I'm projecting into the story. You may have a different perspective or disagree with some of the interpretations, and that's okay. This video is not intended to be a definitive statement that says, this is what it all means. It's one interpretation there may be others. With that said, let's dive into the issue and see what we can see. The first issue opens on the face of Scott Free, also known as Mr. Miracle. This page and the subsequent page will establish a motif that will recur throughout the entire series. The text on these pages correspond to the text on the splash page from the first issue of the original Mr. Miracle series from 1971. The second issue will take text from the second issue of the original series, and so on. This is both a homage to and an acknowledgement of the creator of Mr. Miracle, Jack Kirby. Despite the subject matter and the direction of the series, this miniseries is, in part, a big thank you note to Kirby. It recognizes the multiple interesting characters he created, especially for the fourth world mythology, and, for the most part, remains true to their original nature although they are filled out and modernized to a degree. The original text is also thematically important because it asks a central question. Is he a master of spectacular trickery, or is he something more? Framed another way, who is Scott Free? And is Mr. Miracle an example of this spectacular trickery? Or is it misdirection? Or perhaps self-deception? This is a reasonably good question to ask, because, as we will learn later, Scott Free is not his birth name. It was a name given to him by Granny Goodness. His actual name is unknown, and for whatever reason, he's never investigated what his real name might be. So, when one thinks about it, both Scott Free and Mr. Miracle are identities adopted by the character. In other words, there may be an identity crisis built into the character. In this first panel, we are literally seeing behind the mask. It's a character in the raw. It's a blank expression, a man staring into nothingness, devoid of emotion. We get no answers to the questions we may be asking. He's whatever empty emotion you wish to project onto him, because at that moment, he's giving you nothing. Then we turn the page and we see the only two-page spread in the entire series. And it's Scott sitting in his bathroom, bleeding out from a self-inflicted injury. The shocking scene is made even more unnerving by the text surrounding him. While it invites the reader to venture further, it seems out of place in the scene. Or perhaps, it's Scott that's out of place and the scene is correct. That may be something to consider. The next page is a presumably young Scott Free, arrogantly declaring he's drawn God, despite the fact that no one knows what God looks like. What God looks like, according to Scott, will be answered much later in the series. This is the only page in the issue that doesn't conform to the nine-panel grid, and Scott looks taped into place, which is an artistic choice that is hard to interpret. The following page contains two recurring motifs, the all-black panel with the words, Dark Side Is, and panel distortions. At this point, the meaning to Dark Side Is is very open to interpretation. 
the more obvious meaning, considering the context of Scott's blank, almost meaningless state of being, is that he's become infected with the anti-life equation, which is the formula Darkseid has been seeking for his entire existence. This equation removes free will and makes a person highly susceptible to the will of Darkseid. Effectively, it removes all hope. It makes one a blank automaton. The less obvious meaning is, regardless of your accomplishments or the level of happiness you attain, however you define either, they are offset by the fact that Darkseid, the embodiment of an evil, malignant force, still exists. No matter how wonderful and fulfilling life may be, Darkseid remains. In other words, Darkseid is always a presence. Darkseid is endless. Darkseid is pervasive. Darkseid is. Naturally, all of these meanings directly feed into one another. Within the story, they may not be mutually exclusive. The panel distortion is first seen on a cartoon version of Mr. Miracle happily saying the one line that has defined his life. I can always escape. The distortion is slight, but it is present. It will become even more pronounced in time. What this indicates is that Scott's declaration may not be true. The cheerful cartoon is bookended by the real Scott Free, who does not appear to be trying to escape whatever turmoil he's experiencing. He clearly lies in that state for a significant amount of time, not trying to escape. Scott is released and returns home, where he is confronted by Orion. Two side notes. The cover to the original Mr. Miracle No. 1 is a poster in Scott's living room, yet another Kirby homage. Secondly, the first time Scott speaks, it's to acknowledge his name. But it's a very ambiguous response. He's more acknowledging that someone has spoken the name he usually responds to, but he doesn't fully acknowledge that's his actual name. In a more existential sense, he doesn't acknowledge that's who he is. It's more like, that's who he could be. The person confronting him is Orion, and the two have a bit of history. Briefly, Orion is the son of Darkseid, the ruler of Apocalypse. Scott Free is the son of Highfather, the ruler of New Genesis. Or if you like your metaphors plain, Apocalypse is Hell, and New Genesis is Heaven. These two worlds were at constant war until a pact was made between Darkseid and Highfather. The two rulers traded sons in order to have peace between their worlds. Orion was raised in the opulence of New Genesis, and Scott was raised by the sadistic granny goodness on Apocalypse. They aren't brothers in any sense, and they have rarely been on friendly terms. In this series in particular, Orion is very much his father's son. His potentially cruel disposition is barely tempered by his allegiance to New Genesis. One might even suggest Orion outright dislikes Scott, and he desires to take Scott's birthright, feeling entitled to being the son of Highfather with all the prestige that affords. More to the point, Orion acts like Mr. Miracle isn't worthy of that honor. This is a trait that will become more noticeable as the series progresses. Orion's intent is preceded by Darkseid is, and his intent is open to some interpretation. Orion may be, in his less than subtle way, beating sense back into Scott. Additionally, one cannot overlook the possibility that this is how Orion deals with the news that Scott harmed himself. He may be angered to hear Scott took such an action, and he is taking out that anger on Scott directly. Again, Orion isn't very subtle, but that doesn't mean he's immune to subtlety. Notably, when Barda interrupts Orion, this too is followed by Darkseid Is, thus bringing an end to this scene of violence. Due to this book ending, it may be unintentionally suggesting that Darkseid, in some manner, influenced this act by Orion, or that Darkseid is violence, or he inspires violence, or that Orion is like Darkseid, no matter what he says or does to the contrary. Again, that may be too much interpretation. Once Orion leaves, Scott notices another recurring motif. Barda's eyes change from blue to brown. In fact, it occurs later in this issue and in most subsequent issues. At this point, it's difficult to discern what this may mean, but it does feed into the growing sense that something isn't quite right. It's like there are two realities colliding and influencing one another at random intervals. Or, as we'll soon see, there may be two realities overlapping, producing an ongoing Mandela effect for Scott. Regardless, Barda's changing eye color is a symptom of this wrongness. This is followed by Mr. Miracle's first public appearance since his episode of self-harm. The interviewer is G. Gordon Godfrey, also known as Glorious Godfrey. In the New Gods canon, Godfrey is one of Darkseid's favored minions, who was sent to Earth to spread rhetoric and unrest. So Mr. Miracle being on this program seems like a curious choice. 
The panel distortions are prevalent in this scene, which one could take as the usual distortion one might see while watching a program over the airwaves on an ancient TV set. This is also enhanced by the colors being partially offset, and there's a slight double image that blurs the scene even further. Of course, all of these elements reinforce the notion that something is not quite right with reality. It's offset, blurred, and distorted. Overall, Mr. Miracle appears in disguise, and he's disguising himself. What he's saying to the audience is a distortion. It's not the truth. It's the version of truth he puts out there because there's a certain expectation from his audience to get an answer. He is offsetting that concern by blurring the truth. He can't tell them, or you, the viewing audience, why he actually hurt himself. Quite possibly because he doesn't even know why at this point. So he tells everyone what they need to hear. The act was a gag, a stunt, a performance. It's what he does when in disguise. The segment ends with Godfrey looking directly at the reader and placing doubt in the reader's mind. Is Mr. Miracle still alive, or is there another possibility? Well, you'll have to stay tuned for that answer. Scott meets with his father, and we learn that Darkseid has the anti-life equation. This gives the reader some idea about what Scott might be experiencing. Everything that is happening to him may be a result of Darkseid infecting Scott with the equation. After all, the symptoms seem to fit. Scott then practices with Oberon, who repeats the earlier text about the child drawing God nearly verbatim. Curiously, close-ups of Oberon's face contain yellow clear tape, again as an element that's difficult to define. Barda interrupts this conversation, and over the next few pages, we discover that Oberon passed away. In fact, he passed away shortly before Scott harmed himself, and it was Scott who made the decision to end Oberon's suffering, which led to his death. For the record, this will not be the last time Scott speaks to someone who is apparently dead, but may exist elsewhere. The next few pages have Darkseid is every second panel, as Scott struggles with the realization that Oberon is dead. This culminates in a full black page of Darkseid is, when Scott is notified by Orion that his father is dead, and he has assumed control of New Genesis. War is about to break out in earnest with Apocalypse. This hard cuts to the next day, with Barda and Mr. Miracle preparing to enter a boom tube and go to New Genesis to join the war. For the first time, Scott admits there is something wrong with him. He finally confides to someone that something isn't right. He can't define it, but he knows it's there, and he needs help. He can't escape this emotional trap because he can't see any way out of it, and it may be due to the fact that he doesn't know how to define the trap he's in. Tragically, Barda's response echoes Orion's, and it amounts to just snap out of it and get a grip. Scott slips deep into his condition and decides to remain in disguise, play his part, and do what's expected of him. He has reached out to the person closest to him, and it was no help. So, for the bulk of the series, he will shut down and bury these thoughts and emotions. As things get worse, as the external conflict of the war with Apocalypse rages, he'll remain the same blank, empty. He'll perform as expected, or as the text states, the act will go on. One could justify Barda's reaction by stating the immediacy of the situation needed Scott to focus, and it was within character. However, in hindsight and within context, it's the point when Scott becomes utterly hopeless and fully trapped in this emotional prison. Finally, the issue ends on the text that ends the original first issue of Mr. Miracle, the hopeful words of the text feel false and incongruous, while also ominous. And it's here we see that Barda's eyes are now blue. This color change does give Barda somewhat of an excuse for her reaction and the damage she's done. If there are, let's say, overlapping realities, the Barda with brown eyes may have had a different response to Scott's admission. She may have been sympathetic and paused to address the issue. However, the barter with blue eyes, the one that exists in the regular superhero continuity, would not suffer any weakness. It's still a heartbreaking reaction, but the ambiguity of reality lends to interpretation. What pervades is the sense of hopelessness. The story is undeniably bleak. This is reflected in the very muted color scheme. The only time there is anything bright or fully saturated is when Barda and Scott are in costume. Otherwise, it's a lot of pale, cold blues, and many shades of grayish-brown. Backgrounds are barely sketched in, and they're usually monochrome. 
there is detail and the spaces are defined, but the emphasis is reserved for the foreground characters. This gives one the impression that these somewhat minor details, the backgrounds and such, are murky or slightly undefined, like in a dream or an altered state of mind. Almost the entire issue conforms to a borderless nine-panel grid, which is favored by the writer Tom King. As a manner of staging, it is easy for the eye to adapt to. It feels organic and doesn't distract the eye with heavy or lighter panel sizes. In other words, each panel is given equal weight on the page. The focus is very narrow, so to speak, and it's entirely focused on character. The artwork overall is stunning, and each scene is staged almost flawlessly. Expressions telegraph the emotion of the character very clearly. A lot of heavy lifting is done by the artist, Mitch Gerrids. While the artwork may be on the verge of being impressionistic and simplistic, in the sense that it's not overly busy or concerned with highly rendered detail, it is very effective. Again, this telegraphs the narrow character focus of the series. Worth a mention is the exploration of the anti-life equation as a metaphor for depression or trauma or suppressed emotional distress. It could be a generalized metaphor for mental illness and its variety and subtlety. It doesn't necessarily have to be one specific diagnosis for it to be effective as a metaphor. After all, ambiguity allows for a larger range of identification by the reader. Depending on one's interpretation, the anti-life equation could be taken as the foundation for Scott's condition, or the justification Scott adopts to explain the turmoil he's experiencing. That is, he's looking for an external reason to explain what he thinks and feels without considering the possibility that this is organically developed through the years. The anti-life equation could be seen as a state of denial that these symptoms exist. It all depends on one's interpretation of the metaphor and whether one believes it was triggered by a specific incident such as the death of Oberon or whether it's a culmination of a variety of factors. In the end, Mr. Miracle No. 1 is a fine example of how to set up a story and layer it with tone and atmosphere while adding subtext and a variety of elements that feed the narrative. While other elements and plot twists will be added later, for the most part, the remainder of the series explores everything set up in these 24 pages. Hello and welcome to the end of the video ramble. First of all, thank you very much for watching, and I'd like to take a moment to thank all my fine members. Their support makes videos like this possible. Also, I have it on good authority, they're all very nice people. They may even be slightly more evolved than most. I'm not saying that being a supporter makes you a better person, but I'm also not saying it doesn't. The science is incomplete is all I'm saying. Originally, this started off as an in-depth look at the entire miniseries, which I'll probably do at some point. But to begin with, I had to tear apart this issue because it lays the foundation for all that follows. So I started making notes and, well, it turned into the monster you've just watched. Also worth a mention is I did no research whatsoever other than fact-checking when Glorious Godfrey first appeared. So if there are interviews with the creators, and those interviews contradict what's in the video, then so be it. For better or for worse, this is what I saw when I looked on the page. There's a lot of room for interpretation, and sometimes, like any good story, you get out of it what you put into it. And sometimes you can put too much in, or not enough. With that said, is there anything you agree or disagree with? Did I miss anything? Or, for that matter, did this give you an appreciation for the craft displayed by the creative team? Let me know in the comments. Alright, I really should wrap this up now. Thanks again for watching. I'll talk at you later. Darkseid is. Therefore, I am.